Now I would like to uh, introduce um, the discussant uh, for our next, uh, our first sec uh, session, um, which is on the uh, topic of researching and curating African collections at MA. Um, so Hermina Lobo Guerrero Arenas, um, she is the senior curator in uh, world uh, archaeology uh, at MA. Uh, thank you for joining us, Hermina. Thank you, Benja. And good morning, everyone, and welcome again to our uh, first session of today's <sighs> workshop on researching and curating African collections at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in here in Cambridge. Um, I have to say that um, I'm very pleased to be sharing this this session, and of course to be introducing to you our speakers for this uh, in this this morning. Uh, but before um, we move on to the speakers, uh, let me first tell you how we are going to work. So first, we will have a round of presentations from our panelists uh, that will last between five to 12 minutes or so. And then we will have uh, about 15 minutes or so also for discussion and uh, the Q&A part. So let's um, start. Um, I'm delighted to introduce to you our first speaker this morning um, is Dr. Mark Elliott. Mark is a senior curator in anthropology at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, University of Cambridge, where he has responsibility for collections from Africa, Asia, and Europe. His research background is primarily in South Asia, but he has curated and taught across ethnographic and archaeological collections. He is interested in the complex and uh, little understood inner workings of museums in their history and their impact on collections care and interpretation in the present. He is lead curator on the Stores Move project and contested African histories project at the MAA. So welcome, Mark, and um, uh, please unmute yourself and, and over to you. Thank you so much, Jimena, and thank you to uh, everyone for um, the, um, the really valuable introductions today, which have really helped um, frame um, or at least contextualize what I'm hopefully going to say. Um, I will just attempt to share my screen now, which is always a delicate process. There we are. <clears throat> okay, so our one of our aims today is really to open up the African collections at MAA to critical and creative engagement, to examine how we can create opportunities for museums authority over the collections and their care to be challenged, including but not limited to the removal of objects from their current museum contexts. A lot of this obviously focuses on provenance, on establishing where collections came from and how they got here. It's about the histories and relationships surrounding objects that museum practice has concealed or has revealed. Fundamentally, I think it's about addressing the knowledge that museums have about collections in their care, the gaps in such knowledge, and the perspectives that need to be brought uh, to the interpretation so that they can be part of a richer future. So in this short presentation, which probably isn't going to be short enough, I want to introduce the African collections at MAA and outline some of the things we're doing to better understand these objects, their relationships and histories, and to make all of this accessible to people outside of the walls of the museum, as well as inside. I'll talk about what we as an institution know about the collections and individual objects, how accessible such knowledge is, and what we are doing to try to connect and consolidate the fragments that exist within the museum. But crucially, this is not answering any questions. I'm not sure that I'm even asking any. Rather, it's an effort to open up the collections and historic practices of the museum and its staff to scrutiny, critique, and action. So to start with some statistics, there are 33,042 records in the MAA object catalogues for objects from Africa. And this is across archeological and anthropological or ethnographic collections. And this we think equals approximately 125,000 individual artifacts 
the majority of objects, but less than half of the catalogue records, are archaeological. The ethnographic or anthropological collections comprise almost 18,000 records, and this is what my focus is currently and what we're talking about today. Only 420 objects, or 1.2% of the collections, are currently on display, which sounds like an outrageously no low number, and it is although it should be said that across the museum, only 1.6% of the collections are, are, are on display overall, meaning a staggering 98.4% of the collections that the museum cares for are in storage. 45% of the African collections are now photographed with images on our public online catalogue. The remaining 55% don't yet have images, but descriptions and other information is searchable and accessible on the catalogue, and I'll be coming back to the cataloguing work later. Artifacts from Africa come from 45 different countries across the continent and from over 700 named sources, whether these are collectors, donors, vendors, or other mediators, with, it has to be said, a very small number of previous owners and makers recorded. Of the anthropology collections, 2,782 objects, or 16% of the collection, have no source information whatsoever. We do not know how they came to Cambridge, from whom or when. <clears throat> While MAA holds objects from most countries in Africa, those most represented were, unsurprisingly, former British colonies or protectorates. The largest collection is from Nigeria, um, here in dark blue, with almost 6,000 objects, more than 3,500 of which came from a single collector, Northcott W. Thomas, who is, of course, the focus of the re-entanglement exhibition curated by uh, Paul Basu at MAA, and which is open until 20th of April here in Cambridge. South Africa in orange, Kenya in grey, uh, Uganda and in yellow, each number between 1,000 and 1,500 objects. There are also significant collections from Sudan in light blue and South Sudan, about which we'll hear a little bit more later from Zoe from Ghana in light green, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Cameroon, and Egypt. Most other countries are represented by 100 objects or less. While many of the collections were provided by multiple donors, uh, so in the case of Nigeria, there's 120 different, don different uh, actors who contributed collections to the museum, or 80 for Ghana, 74 for Uganda, for example, there are large collections of often hundreds of objects assembled by individuals from uh, many of these countries. So other patterns emerge in this second and I promise final chart, which show the number of objects from Africa that came to the museum in each decade from the foundation of the institution in 1884. As we can see from this, the early years of the museum and the early years of formal colonization in Africa see a small number of objects coming in, 87 objects catalogued as ethnography uh, in the first five years of the museum's history, for example, 316 between 1890 and 1899. But from 1900, acquisitions increased dramatically to 1500 in the first decade of the 20th century, up to a staggering 4,860 between 1910 and 1919, which is very largely Northcott Thomas again, and dropping to uh, 2,800 in the 1920s and 1,400 in the 1930s. So the most intensive period of acquisition is therefore in the peak of, uh, of I guess, imperial expansion in Africa. Acquisitions start waning in the 1930s and 1940s, perhaps reflecting um, the escalation of military activity in the continent, but also a shift away from the study of material culture within anthropology, at least in Cambridge. To get away from the trends and the patterns, though, uh, two ongoing projects um, currently on MAA are part of a concerted effort to better understand and make visible collections from Africa and elsewhere. Both are only first steps, preparing the ground for future work inside and outside the museum. The Stores Move project is by far the largest collections project that the museum has undertaken in generations. Uh, we're working to transfer 250,000 objects from 162 countries across archaeology and anthropology collections, from the offsite facility where they have been 
uh, stored for five decades to a newly refurbished space with vastly improved conditions and space for physical access in an old nuclear bunker in the south of the city. I think it's fair to say that all of us are aware of the implications of that, um, which I imagine we might discuss later today. 12 members of staff are working for five years to painstakingly unpack, check the physical condition and documentation, photograph, repack and transport every single object, including all of the ethnographic collections from Africa. To put this in context, if the team spends only 15 minutes on each object, it would take 50 person years to complete this work. New images and cleaned up data are being uploaded to our public database at collections.maa.cam.ac.uk and I'll relentlessly put that link into the chat today. <clears throat> um, new images are being uploaded every day with hundreds of new images being uploaded each week. 30% of the collections have now been moved to date and are now accessible for visits as well as digitally online. West and North Africa collections have been completed. Uganda, South Sudan, Sudan and Ethiopia have been completed and the team starts work on Somalia this week and Kenya next week. Central and Southern Africa will be done in late 2022 and early 2023. So I just want to emphasize how much of a work in progress this is and how vital it is that we can uh, begin and maintain collaborations at this early stage. In parallel, a project supported by a Cambridge Humanities Research Grant is carrying out an initial data gathering exercise, collecting traces of provenance for African collections in the MAA archives. The methodology is perhaps disarmingly simple essentially going through the decades of archive letters and recording any letter that refers to Africa. The objective is quite simply to establish what information there is as to the geographical origin, the circumstances of taking, or individuals and communities that made or used objects before they were taken. What we know so far is that there is in fact a great deal of information about object provenances and pre-acquisition significance in the museum's catalog records though it's of course fragmentary and inconsistent. Initial result, results from the archive project presents an even more fragmentary picture. Information is sporadic. <clears throat> Donors or collectors accounts of how objects came into their possession are few and far between. In some cases, documentary evidence renders objects provenance more ambiguous rather than less, opening up or identifying new gaps in institutional knowledge and memory. So in what remains of uh, the time I've got allocated today, I want to quickly highlight a couple of individual objects that have emerged from these two projects to present what is known, unknown and ambiguous about them from the admittedly narrow perspective of, of, the, me of the museum. This figure, for example, is of the Yoruba uh, god of smallpox, Shopona, and as ever, uh, apologize, uh, apologies for any mispronunciation that will no doubt come into this presentation. It was donated in 1939 by Selwyn McGregor Greer, a Cambridge educated member of the colonial service in Nigeria from 1906 to 1929. He wrote that it was confiscated at uh, Ogbomosho in 1917. This cult, he said, had been forbidden by law only owing to the fact that the priests deliberately spread the infection for their own ends. McGregor was assistant resident at Ibadan from 1913 and was evidently involved in this punitive action. There's obviously a great deal to be investigated and said about this imposition of colonial law on local spiritual um, and medical practice and indeed the assumptions of the motivation and perceived agency of those involved during um, an epidemic, I guess. These two drums were taken from the Ashanti Hene's palace in Kumasi, capital of the Ashanti Empire, in what is now Ghana, of course. One of them in 1896 and one at an unknown date. A dono or hourglass drum played by women and an atopan or, or talking drum. The talking drum is, I think, a particularly vivid illustration of British forces assault on the voice of the Ashanti elite, a direct attack on the authority and sovereignty of the Ashanti Empire. The dono was donated to uh, 
MAA by the Cambridge anthropologist Alfred Court Hutton, one time acting curator of MAA. And while the records are absolutely explicit about the circumstances of their, of their acquisition, i.e. that they were taken from Kumasi in 1896, the identity of the person who took it is not known. The talking drum was apparently brought back to England by Mr. Knowles, late of the colonial service, and if anyone knows who Mr. Knowles was, I'd be very pleased to hear, and donated by Lady Louisa Cohen. Once again, the chain of covenants is broken, but the connection with the armed suppression of the Ashanti Empire is absolutely clear. But finally, while the archives and documentation of collections can create certainty, they can also erode it or complicate it. In 1939, a Mr. W.W. Collins offered artifacts from West Africa. A letter found in the archives provides further context to the collection, explaining why they were largely attributed to Benin in the museum's catalogue, although that connection was never made explicit in the catalogue records. I have here, Collins wrote, one large West African seat and one smaller, and other things including a musical instrument, a wooden sword, etc. Would they be of any use to you? They belonged, he wrote, to my late brother's wife, who predeceased him, and were brought home by her first husband, Captain Jackson, who served with the West African Field Force in the Benin expedition. The author was William Wehe Collins, a noted landscape painter born in Mauritius. His brother Francis, a school teacher and graduate of Gonvalinkis College, Cambridge, again, had passed away on the 5th of January 1939, days before this letter was written. But there's a problem. According to other records, when Francis and Lillian married, she was noted as a spinster, so there was no mention of a previous husband. Also, they married in 1896, when she was just 23. So if there was a husband, he obviously wouldn't have participated in the Benin expedition of 1897 before Lillian married Francis. Of course, this was one man's memory of the family of his sister-in-law, who had died four decades previously. But it starts to make a bit more sense when we look at the other objects Collins donated. The West African stool he mentioned in his letter is clearly an iconic Akan uh, stool in Asasedwa from Ghana. Alongside it is Nakuaba, an Akan fertility figure. The objects are <clears throat> Abramo, Akan gold whites, gold dust boxes, and scales, associated with the gold dust economy of the Ashanti Empire. So perhaps Collins's account was inaccurate, and that Captain Jackson, whether he was a previous husband or another relation, actually served in one of the assaults on the Ashanti capital in Kumasi, um, <clears throat> uh, which occurred between 1823 uh, and 1900. This is a guess so far, but perhaps they may well have been taken in um, uh, the Third Anglo-Ashanti War or First Ashanti Expedition, which destroyed the palace of the, Shanti, the Ashanti Hene in February 1874. Unfortunately, however, there are literally dozens of Jacksons involved in the Anglo-Ashanti Wars, um, so that doesn't get us very far. I must say that I'm hugely grateful to Marianne Milko, who will be speaking later uh, uh, in in, in helping us sift through some of the other Jacksons that may be out there. Uh, to date, I feel, uh, no, uh, no clarity. So that's kind of a whirlwind, but what conclusions, if any, would I draw from this data and from these examples? I think incompleteness, the contingent and fragmentary data that we hold as a museum, the fragmentary memory that we have in relation to these objects in our care. But what do we do with that? Our approach so far is to make as many of these fragments as possible visible in the public domain. To make these objects, the knowledge and the gaps plainly visible. As I said at the outset, these are very much first steps, but they are essential. Restitution of objects, of knowledge, of interpretative authority or of agency is impossible without a knowledge and understanding of what is in museums. You cannot ask for what you don't know exists. But neither can museums be proactive, as I fervently hope that we will be, in enabling future restitution projects if we do not know what we have and do not know what we know and what we don't know. I end with an appeal and an invitation then to interrogate MAA's collections database, to challenge our authority, our assumptions and our mistakes, 
and to help us continue the work of transferring authority to a more diverse group of people, group of voices that we will see examples of later today. And I'm very sorry for taking up so much time. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, um, for uh, such a fantastic overview of what we are doing. Uh, you are doing the team, um, the whole team um, is doing for better understand what we have uh, regarding African collections. Uh, certainly uh, uh, very interesting, uh, but necessary challenge um, we need to, to face. So um, thanks again. Now we are going to move uh, to our second speaker. Um, also delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Sui Kormark, uh, who is currently a visiting researcher at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, University of Cambridge. She is a historian and anthropologist whose research focuses on the history of collecting colonialism and the contemporary uses of heritage in Eastern Africa. Her latest publication, Pieces of a Nation, South Sudanese Heritage and Museum Collections was published by Sidestone Stone Press in 2021. So welcome Zoe, um, thank you for being here uh, and over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, so um, I'm currently a visiting researcher at MAA and I'm working on um, provenance and ownership issues um, for the Sudanese and South Sudanese collections. Um, so I'm really kind of building on the kind of curatorial projects um, that Mark has just described and trying to um, take a closer look um, at um, um, trying to understand who the original owners um, of objects were, um, how um, those owners were parted from their possessions and on identifying objects, particularly from the Sudanese and South Sudanese collections that may have been looted or have particularly problematic provenance. So I want to talk about um, an object um, that I think shows some of the complexities and challenges of this work that you know, Mark has already situated. Um, it is an object, I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, let's share my PowerPoint. Great, um, so it um, is an object from Darfur, Sudan that was given to MAA in 1937 um, by Anthony John Arkell who was the assistant governor of Darfur between 1932 and 1937. And it came to the museum um, with 400 other objects, mainly from Darfur, which comprise one of the largest single donations from Sudan. Um, so it is a, it's a pepper container made from buffalo horn uh, with a leather strap decorated at the base with a geometric design. Uh, it's never been on display um, it is an object of sovereignty in the sense that it is closely connected to the leadership of an independent African sultanate that survived well into the 20th century. So the information on the museum catalogue um, states that this, court, this horn, quote, belonged to Ramadan Bura and was used for pepper for troops. He was one of Ali Dinar's generals. And this information seems to have been supplied by Arkel, the donor himself, as he describes the horn in very similar terms in his personal papers. Um, I'm going to talk about who Ramadan Bura and Ali Dinar were and why it is significant that a colonial official should have possession of this pepper horn. But first, a couple of uh, points to kind of about the historical context that are important for interpreting it. So Sudan was invaded by British and Egyptian forces in the 1890s, um, which culminated in the Battle of Omdurman in 1898, um, one of the most bloody and notorious British military victories of the 19th century. So like comparable events of this period, 
many objects were removed from Sudan and there is a huge amount of material in British museums as a result. So after the Battle of Omdurman, colonial rule was established in Sudan. However, Darfur remained an independent sultanate until 1916, when it was overthrown by a British invasion um, and incorporated into the colonial administration. So the last sultan of Darfur was Ali Dinar, and he's the Ali Dinar who's named in the catalogue, a hugely important figure in Sudanese history who fought against the British at Omdurman and who was killed in the 1916 invasion of Darfur. So this was also a looting event and British museums also hold personal belongings and of Ali Dinar that were taken during this campaign. So how does the horn at MAA fit into this? Um, so Ramadan Ali Bura, the owner of the horn, was the commander in chief of Ali Dinar's army in 1916. So he held one of the most important positions in the Sultanate. He led the Sultan's army against the British invasion and during which he was himself also shot and killed. A British intelligence officer who was present estimated that Ramadan was about 32 years old at the time of his death, so he was young. Um, and what else um, can, I, can I say about him? Um, well, colonial intelligence files um, also note that Ramadan was with Sultan Ali Dinar at the Battle of Omdurman, and that he was enslaved at the time. Information that is plausible given that he came from one of the communities in Southern Darfur that were historically enslaved in the Sultanate. Now, clearly I can only scratch at the surface of the complexity of Ramadan's life. This is someone who experienced enslavement, who participated in the Battle of Omdurman, quite likely as a child, and who then attained the highest rank in the army of the Sultanate and died defending it. Now we don't know very much about how Arkel got this horn in the 1930s, 20 years after Ramadan's death, apart from that he appears to have acquired it in Al Fasha, which was the capital of the Darfur Sultanate and the headquarters of the colonial administration. Did he purchase it? He did buy a lot of the objects that he assembled, but from whom? And under what circumstances? Did he confiscate it? He was certainly in a position to be able to do that. But we probably can't answer these questions now. And maybe we don't need to. But for me, so for me, this horn, it raises several important issues. I think firstly, it shows that it is possible to work with really quite limited catalog information to recontextualize an object and to connect it to somebody's life and death. And this kind of work surely is vital um, for having more honest conversations about the collections, their significance and their futures. This is surely a, a kind of a baseline. And it also shows the difficulty in clearly defining and drawing a line around looted and non-looted objects. So this horn was not seized at the battlefield in 1916, like we know other objects were. But it is nonetheless a spoil of war. And it shows that colonial officials continued to seek out objects associated with pre-colonial authorities for at least 20 years after the occupation of Darfur, some of which, like this horn, have now been subsumed into apparently ethnographic collections. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if for uh, your presentation. I think examples will always be a the better, one of the good ways to understand things and, and hear centrally um, 
uh, we can see the problems that arise when trying to understand the history of objects and, and that intricate relationship with individuals. So thank you very much again. Um, so now we move in to our third and last speaker for this first uh, session. Um, Mary Ann Middlecoop is a postdoctoral researcher on the AHRC DFG funded project, the restitution of knowledge artifacts as archives in the post-colonial museum, 1850-1939 at the University of Oxford and a junior research fellow in history of art at St. Peter's College, Oxford. She completed her PhD in history at the University of Cambridge in 2019. Um, prior to becoming a researcher in Oxford, Mary Ann was a teaching associate in history of art at Cambridge and a researcher for the Commission of Looted Art in Europe, London. She is an affiliated lecturer in history of art at the University of Cambridge and co-convener of the Cambridge Research and Collections Programme Ownership 2020-22. Um, over to you, Mary Ann. Thank you for being here. Thank you um, for that introduction and um, I will start screening, sharing my screen immediately. Right, so I'm a researcher, um, as already mentioned, for the Restitution of Knowledge project at the Pit Rivers, which is a collaborative project with the TEO in Berlin and it's led by Danix and Benedict Savoie. Now, this project aims to share and build knowledge of incidents of looting during mi military missions in Africa. And it also aims to document the connections between these events and objects in European museums. Now, one of the questions this, in this project um, that we try to, that we kind of try to answer and grapple with is how were objects, once they arrived in the UK, dispersed and disseminated between national public institutions, anthropology and military museums and private owners. So how did that happen? Now we know that especially important trophies and gifts were sent to the sovereigns as symbols of imperial victory. We also know that the British museums benefited from commissioning from those who accompanied expeditions. And finally, museums and individuals also bought at auctions where prize was sold. And it's on this final um, note that I will um, focus today. So in this system described by General Wolseley in his soldier's pocketbook for, for field service, the British army sought to regulate the taking of loot via an ordered re redistribution of the spoils according to the rules of war. The general officer would call on his officers to elect or appoint two or three prize agents who would decide whether the property set aside would be transferred into money via an auction on the spot or back home to furnish prize money. And this prize money would then be distributed among officers in all the ranks or pay for the retentions at home. This was seen as a bureaucratic endeavor and a legitimate retribution for a perceived wrong at the time. And I should say these prize allocations were always accompanied by trophy hunting by individual soldiers as well, which often led to the trading of mementos or the purchasing of items outside the prize system. And here um, it, it is between what the distinction that some scholars make here between official booty, unofficial booty and trophies. But what has this to do with the necklace, you may ask? So this gold cast necklace is made of 60 ornate discs, 10 25 V-shaped beads, and 30 pendants representing Lunatella shells, all strung on a length of bright red cotton. And it is currently in the collection of the MAA, where an old display label reads, and I quote, Asante from King Prempe's treasure house, Kumasi, Ghana. 1896 Asante Expedition, donated by Miss Mabel Taylor. 
Now, this information is based on two letters in the acquisition register addressed to the curator of the Fitzwilliam Museum, in fact, in 1918. I have been requested to ask where, whether you would care to accept, writes a certain Mr. M. E. Bix from Oxford, a gold barbaric necklace for exhibition in the Fitzwilliam Museum. It belonged to the kings of Kumasi and fell into the hands of the British, note the language, fell into the hands of the British when they captured the city during the Ashanti Wars. This necklace belonged to Miss Mabel Taylor, a former student of Girton College who died recently. Her mother and sister think that she would have liked it offered to Cambridge University. Whereas Bix remains unclear about the specific moment when this, this necklace was taken as loot in Kumasi, a second letter by Miss Mabel's mother clarifies the situation, it seems. On the 24th of November in 1918, so just after the end of the, the First World War, Mrs. Taylor writes that, and I quote, the necklace belonged to my late daughter, Mabel M. Taylor, and came into her possession after the Asante War, when our government sold King Coffee's personal jewelry. Now, although the old label ascribed the necklace as taken from Kim Prempe's palace during the 1896 expedition, this appears not to be the account of events given by Mrs. Taylor. Her letter seems to suggest that th this necklace was taken in 1874, when the British invaded Asante and ransacked the palace of the Asante Hene, Kofi Kari Kari, Aka, King Kofi, um, which is how he was named in the UK. So what happened in 1874? In 1874, one of the first things General Wolseley did when the Brit British army entered Kumasi was tour the royal palace. When the extent of gold and all the valuables it contained was understood, a guard was set up and a prize committee appointed to select the most valuable objects, including those objects of sovereignty. Before the army returned to England, Wolsey held a public auction of most of the loot. It produced about £5,000, which was used to establish a fund for the descendants of men killed in the war. A subsequent auction was held in London by Gerard, the crown, crown's jeweller. This auction, we know, featured objects taken from the palace together with the finest royal ornaments, um, court regalia, weapons and jewellery, um, such as this necklace. And it was here that some of the most exquisite pieces um, passed into a major museum and private collections like that of Sir, um, Sir Richard Wallace, the Wallace collection today, and Miss Taylor. And here should say that the prize money was still considered too little to, con to distribute so additional funds were then made available by the government. Eventually, the Asante necklace entered the MAA in 1918. In her final comments, Mrs. Taylor suggests that the donor will be indicated, if necessary, as, and I quote, from two Girton students, sisters. Instead, the museum chooses to say, cho choose to say looted from Kim Prempe's treasure house, Kumasi. My suggestion would not only be to consider changing this to King Coffee's palace at Kumasi and its ransacking, ransacking by the British army in 1874, but to tell its full story. How it transitioned from being part of the, the likely to have been part of the royal regalia to being loot, then official loot and price, after which it was sold at auction in London to become a Girton student necklace before being made part of an ethnographic museum collection 44 years later. And what about the other objects, you may say? Because contrary to this fine ne necklace, for many objects from West Africa in the MAA, um, as you've just heard, but also in other UK collections, a comprehensive view on their provenance is often still lacking and references to military expeditions, um, their aftermath and the subsequent dissemination of looted objects are scarce. Yet yeah, what this case shows us is that we need no more than a single fine artifact, an object of sovereignty to tell us
the long forgotten story of a military culture of taking official loot and price. And the question is, I think, will we use this moment, this in-between phase, the momentum that's been created prior to the removal, perhaps, and the possible return of this artifact to do this? Will we show and tell this story? Thank you. Thank you, Marianne, uh, for your presentation. And well, thanks again to all of our speakers this morning, Mark, Zoe, and Marianne, um, for all those very interesting insights. I think um, you all have shown us how important uh, is to really and deeply understand collections um, to go to the very basics of, of knowing what we, what we have, um, but in particular, there's stories uh, and more important, the duty we have to responsibly act by gathering and uncovering all the relevant information um, to recompose that object history and, and that is ultimately uh, people's history. Yes, um, I think uh, all of you have um, had an emphasis on the um, um, life histories of objects, but also on the importance of digging up in archives. Um, um, I think, of course, it's, it's absolutely necessary, but I guess my, um, my comment here uh, will go from my perspective as an archaeologist. Um, I'm thinking about, of course, our African collections. Um, how can this entire process, well, I guess this is also a question for you. Uh, <laughs> um, how this entire process of restitution and, and digging up archives, when you, of course, have them, um, when you um, actually are dealing with archaeological objects who, uh, that you know were looted and from which we, of course, don't have uh, documentary, documentary sources. Um, how can we actually develop and, and, and better understand what I would say are like archaeological gaps? Um, because of course you have shown us very interesting uh, examples of how can we um, try to explain, uh, but what if we don't have those kind of sources? Uh, what if we um, are probably just relying on, on, on documentary? Um, what could happen with all the restitution uh, in, in, in this restitution complex process of. Um, so I, I'm going to open that discussion with that um, first uh, question and I'll be taking um, question of course, of course uh, from if we can possibly because I'm just uh, looking at uh, time and we're running a bit uh, late. So please you, any, any comments on that? Um, could I jump in with a very open answer to, to that, I think? Um, I mean, the, the, the short answer, and this has been the theme of what I've said this morning, is that I don't know. Um, and I think, I think certainly we find, I mean, we, we find that an awful lot of the practice that we're doing within museums feels, from an ignorant anthropologist point of view, like an archaeology of the institution, right? You know that that the, this this is the context that, that that we're working in. These are the this is these are the sites and the materials that that we're um, that we're trying to make sense of. Um, I think the, I mean, on one level, I th there was a point in the there was a question in in the Q and A um, that may relate to this. Some communities of practice span colonial boundaries. Um, I hence don't necessarily identify with the colonial boundaries how do we catalog these contested objects i think i think there have been a couple of questions about the distinction between archaeology and anthropology and and from my point of view that sort of feels historic 
you know, that the, there is um, <clears throat> an understanding the historic difference between be, between archaeology as and, and anthropology as practiced and as manifested in the collections is 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 one approach. I think um, I think is essentially having space to blow apart these disciplinary um, disciplinary framings going forward is is really really critical. Um, and to some extent, maybe that's not work that can be done, but can be prepared by by museum curators, if 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 that makes sense. I think, uh, but I think also it's just exploring the exploring the collections. It's it's coming it's coming up against objects, coming up against sources that 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 really really best illustrates the gaps. You know, I I think we did not know what we didn't know before we started a lot of this work. We're on our way to understanding what we don't know now, um, and you know, so identifying the gaps and then understanding how they might be filled and who they might be filled by feels like um, feels like what's going to keep us busy for for decades to come. Um, sorry, that said nothing, but that's what I think. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. So you want to say something? Yeah, if I can just follow up from that, I think, you know, from my experience of kind of trying to dig around in the archives at MAA and um, um, over, the, over the last few weeks, I think that um, there are a lot of gaps. I think there are always going to be gaps. The, the, the information stored in the museum is always going to be partial. And I think that the the kind of sources available for people doing research, you know, in the UK are also always going to be partial. I think that kind of looking forward, um, ways to connect um, uh, with um, other sources of knowledge about objects is really important. Um, I think on the other hand, I, I feel that we are, quite early in the process of research actually and that there is a lot that can be um, uncovered um, within the archives and that you know that seems like an essential kind of starting point at least something to to build in on but we know it's it's incomplete thank, thank you Zoe um, Marianne, do you want to add something to this round? Thank you, Jimena. Um, well, just to echo what, what has been said and also to echo what Zoe mentioned in her presentation and sort of where it overlaps with mine, really, that um, we do not always have the data of the individual who took an object, but we might not always need that in order to tell the story or to um, to, to facilitate um, and um, enable the return. Um, so th there are these broader narratives that we really need everybody um, in this room uh, for um, from military historians to people that have researched this in all other kinds of ways um, to the communities to say, well, there is this bigger narrative, not just of colonialism, but also of military culture. And if we manage to sort of tell that and I think it will create a further wave of people coming forward with information about these objects but also with stories that that fill that history of war and um taking and loot and so I would say yeah that's that's important to bring out there like we do today um and I hope we we can continue to do and I also hope the museum will um do so in their displays in in the near future and as it already does. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Well, I have to say that uh, unfortunately, time as always happen is, is a bit out of um, control and um, against our desires of being here and keep talking and discussing. Uh, there are, are a lot of questions and comments that we will be answering um, in the chat and the Q&A. Um, so thank you for those that are just uh, leaving their, their insights um, and for being here. Uh, I, always, um, I, I want to thank again, Mark and, and Marianne and Zoe. Um, and I'm going to hand it over again to 
Benja, um, just, hi Benja. <laughs> Hello, thank you. Thank you so much, Amina, and thank you, Mark, Zoe, and Marianne, for um, a really um, uh, interesting conversation and overview of the MA collection, and also sharing some of the examples from the archival record as it relates to the object, which is quite useful to put things in context. So really grateful to you all for the, um, for the presentations. Um, so